Hello, I'm Margaret and I'm here to talk about womb cancer. Today is International Womb Cancer Awareness Day and I don't know if you know but it's a little known cancer and yet 1900 women in the UK die annually from womb cancer. 23 women a day are diagnosed of which five people die. This has a great effect on, on families. It's somebody's mother, somebody's sister, somebody's grandmother, somebody's auntie. Um, I've made a video which you can access on Cancer Stories and I hope that you find the information on there useful. Thank you. My name is Margaret Chandler, I'm 55 years old and I live in Glenparva, which is a suburb to the south of Leicester. I live with my husband Duncan and my 16 year old son Rory. I've lived in Leicester for 28 years now, but I was brought up in the north of England. I grew up with my mum and dad and my younger brother Graham in Rochdale. Um, an industrial town just north of Manchester. I grew up in the 1960s and I felt as a child, compared to children today, I had an awful lot of freedom and my abiding memories really are being outdoors a lot of the time, playing outdoors, being incredibly active. And my school was the type of place where they would take us out walking, hill walking. I was out in the Lake District, Yorkshire Dales, Peak District. And it set me up really for a lifetime of activity really. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. I've done a lot of walking. And when I met my husband, we used to go up most weekends to the Lake District and I think we've even spent our wedding anniversary climbing Snowdon. <laughs> um, I've always been interested in health, well-being. I've always looked after myself and been active. And it came as a great shock in 2013 when I was diagnosed with a uterine cancer. Margaret, thanks for coming in today and joining us on the Cancer Stories program. Um, I want to welcome you to the program and I know viewers will be interested in your story. I heard your biography that um, you have suffered a uterine cancer. Yeah. You're actually the first person to come in and talk to us with a uterine cancer. So I'm very interested to hear and learn more about it. Um, could I ask you at the beginning how it came about? What, did, what was the first sign something was wrong? Um, the first sign that something was wrong was in August 2011 when I had um, four periods within nine weeks. Um, they were a lot heavier than my normal period and yeah, I had, um, yeah, I had quite bad flooding mm. and I felt it was not normal. I was still having monthly periods every four weeks and four periods within nine weeks was just not the norm. So I, I went off to my GP immediately and they automatically referred me to a gynaecologist at the Leicester Royal Infirmary. I went, I think in September, 2011 and was given a, hyster a hysteroscopy um, where they, they have a look round and they take a biopsy of the lining of the uterus. Um, I was actually diagnosed at this point with complex hyperplasia, which is a non-malignant condition. It's just a thickening of the lining of the womb. And I was at a level two out of four with this condition. There was a potential that it could develop into a cancer, but it was actually a very, very low risk. And I never thought anything more of it. Hmm. Um, at that point, I was put on um, progesterone for three months. I think it was at the highest dose for the longest time 
and I went back after three months and again had another hysteroscopy and things had not changed. I think usually they find that it can can go away but it hadn't. Um, I then was, um, I came back again I think another three months later and I did ask for another hysteroscopy and it was at this point that um, it, you know, the cancer was actually found. I'd got an appointment at the end of January 20, 2013 to go to a different hospital, a different consultant. And I thought it was a bit strange, but I trotted along the following Monday. And um, it was at that point that I was given the diagnosis. <laughs> so, <laughs> How was that process handled when you were given the diagnosis? Um, well, I was on my own for a start off. I was not told to bring anybody else along with me. So I was on my own. I, the word cancer had never been mentioned. Um, and it was one heck of a shock because I'd... You weren't I'd, expecting I wasn't expecting it at all, no. No. Um, do you think in retrospect that should have been done slightly differently? Um, in retrospect, I'm actually glad it was done on my, by myself, actually. It's, um, I think if I'd have been dealing with other family members and having to consider how they would handle it, I actually feel it's better that I did it by myself. Mm. What information did they give you initially about how the cancer looked? Either the stage, how aggressive it might be, the future, you know, what, how were things looking at that, at that moment? Um, I actually wasn't given any grading at all at that particular point, but I was told by the nurse that I wasn't to worry that it could be dealt with. Um, I had been told I would need a hysterectomy literally in four weeks' time. It had already been booked. The date had been booked, the operation had been booked. But I was told that the prognosis looked good. There was a possibility I may need radiotherapy when they opened me up. Um, they had to find out how things were going once it had been um, once I'd been opened up. They did say it was a slow go growing cancer, so um, which was good. Did they know that from the biopsy? Um, I think so, but I think I think generally uterine cancer is a slow growing cancer and it's contained within the organ so it takes quite a while I think before it spreads out into lymph nodes and to perhaps the bladder the bowel and the other organs around so I think they were qu they were quite confident that mm. it could be dealt with at that stage. Mm. Out of interest do you know the typical symptoms that people present with with the uterine cancer just in case people are watching and they want to know you know, I know what to look out for now. Yeah, um, it's generally um, unexplained bleeding. I mean, at one point, this disease was generally just seen in postmenopausal women over 50. Um, so any bleeding that shows up after the menopause was a cause to be checked out by your doctor. But increasingly, with a change in lifestyle nowadays, um, they are finding that more and more younger women are actually being diagnosed. I think it, a lot of it is weight problems. Obesity is seen as more of a risk factor. So it's, I think younger women need to be aware of any heavier periods, any, any, anything that's a change in their normal cycle. It's to get it checked out by your GP. But... Actually, GPs themselves need to be more aware that it's not just a disease of older women. So if younger women are showing up in your surgery with heavy periods or unexplained bleeding, different to um, any pain or bloating, um, they need to be aware that there's a possibility that a uterine cancer could be, could be there. <laughs> and it's one we don't hear so much about compared to other cancers like a breast cancer. Uh, prostate cancer and yeah. other cancers. Yeah, um, yeah but uh, I mean since I've had the cancer myself um, it is actually the fourth commonest cancer in women. It's actually more common than cervical cancer and ovarian cancer. 
and there are still 1900 women a year who in, in the UK who die from this cancer. That's very valuable so, and to know that. For something that's actually an unknown cancer. I didn't know about it till I was diagnosed with it myself. We all need to be a bit more aware of this area, I think. And what about the um, idea of support groups and resources that are out there? Um, we're jumping ahead to what you may have found later, but just while we're on the topic, is it a cancer where if you reach out and look on the internet, there is a lot of information and support or, or are you, is it one of those areas you're struggling to find good resources? Um, I've actually only found, I've found a womb cancer support group just literally in the last three to four months. It's actually online and it's been set up, it was set up by a lady in 2011. She was diagnosed in 2009 and found that there was very little support for this cancer. Um, we're actually an online community and it's a means of feeling less alone with this cancer. We've got a, we've got a private group where we can sort of discuss treatment or how we feel and if we're not having a good day. <laughs> um, but really it's, it's something that we, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of support out there. I don't know whether it's because it can be seen as something that can be dealt with. I don't know, but it's becoming there is there is help out there, but and support, but we need to you know, need to look for it. Really. I want to ask you now about the main treatment you had. I think in your case it was surgery. So, what surgery did they recommend, and then did you undergo? Um, yeah, I had to have a total hysterectomy, so I've had the uterus removed and I've had both of my ovaries removed and both of my tubes removed. And this was actually done with keyhole surgery, um, but I was warned beforehand that I may have to have the total cut if they weren't able to um, remove the organs through keyhole surgery. But I was lucky enough to be able to have the keyhole surgery. Okay, so they were able to do the keyhole surgery, so that probably meant uh, a more rapid recovery? Yeah, I mean, I think from wound, I mean, I, I literally had three, well, I just had three little um, cuts the holes, there. Yeah. I didn't have the whole... Um, what was your initial memory of waking up after the surgery? Do you remember that time now? Um, yeah, I was just completely disorientated, really. Yeah. And um, but I was quite lucky. I was expecting to be having a morphine pump, but I was actually only on paracetamol. So really, that's quite, all you needed. Yeah, that was wow, all. That's I, remarkable. Yeah, so I literally just had paracetamol, and um, they literally had. I, I think you were. I think you had a lot of packing internal and sort of vaginal packing, and I had a catheter as well and that was removed at midnight. I had it on a Saturday and it was removed at midnight um, on the Saturday. So literally I had to get out of bed <laughs> the next morning. Um, How long did they keep you in then? Um, I was actually, I, I went in on the Saturday morning and I was told I could go home on the Sunday afternoon, but I actually said, I'm not going home because I think my family will be expecting me to cook Sunday lunch if <laughs> I get home um, then. So <laughs> I actually went home on the Monday morning, but yeah, I could have gone home on the middle of the Sunday afternoon. How quick was your recovery after that uh, discharge home? Um, a lot longer than I actually thought. Um, I found I was extremely tired. I was able, I mean, I was mobile, I could get about, but um, I think my abiding memory is I, I've always been active, always been fit, and if I do get an illness, even a flu, I'm usually, I can be ill on a Monday and I'll be back by Friday. But I think my abiding memory is it took me, I had to go and have a lie down for an hour and a half after getting out of bed, going to the loo, walking downstairs and eating my breakfast. It was absolutely, um, I've never known sort of tiredness like it. Was that the effect of the surgery, do you believe? 
Um, I think it, it possibly was at that stage. And I do remember not being able to, I didn't leave the house for a month. I literally, I mean, I was able to walk about, but just walk about at the house. And I can remember the energy it took eventually after four weeks just to be able to walk to the end of the street. Yeah, I, was, it, I, I did think I'd be back at work within six or eight weeks. I thought I'd be just back and I'd get over it. And Whereas it took how long? Um, I actually didn't get back to work and I was actually off for six, six and a half months in okay. the end. Yeah, quite it a took while. me, yeah, it took me quite a while. I did take, I did decide to take the summer off and um, I decided to give, you know, give myself time to recover. And I've been back at work for a year now and apart from a couple of water infections, I've had some quite nasty water infections. I've actually been really well and I think having taken that time I think it aided your recovery mm. and I've been able to get back back to work. Do you think um, you should have been given more help or advice during that recovery and then rehabilitation period? Were you given any pointers as to what to do or were you left to your own devices? Um, I actually felt yeah, I felt I was I was discharged into the care of my GP, and I mean I actually thought I would possibly have well I ex I expected to have a district nurse. I mean I've been told it was major surgery, and I would I expected to have a district nurse even just popping around for five minutes for perhaps the first two or three weeks, and I actually didn't have any. I didn't have any anybody at all. I was sent out with three plasters. I had to change my own sort of wounds and everything and I actually felt if I'd have had that extra care I, I did feel I don't I think my recovery would have possibly been a bit quicker but it sounds to me like you were pushing yourself quite a bit to do a little bit more each day yeah I mean yeah I mean I did I did feel I mean I, I certainly think it was the walking I, I, I just felt each day I did feel it was sort of part of my recovery and part of my therapy so I didn't leave the house for four weeks, but af after that, I um, I made sure that I went out every day, and each day I sort of did a bit more, a bit more, and I did find that there were friends who would come out and they'd take me for a walk, and because at first I remember being quite, I mean, I wouldn't even cross the road because I couldn't, I, I just felt, I just couldn't sort of, I wasn't aware of. Um, So the, the recovery period was a little bit of a battle by the sound of it. Um, did you have any symptoms or complications? I'm thinking there you've had the uterus removed and the ovaries as well. So it's uh, logical that they might consider um, HRT. Um, in a normal hysterectomy where the ovaries have been removed, ladies would be offered HRT. But because I'd had cancer, my consultant, um, there's always a fear that HRT can cause further cancer. So in my case, I wasn't offered HRT. So I was left to deal with that. Really. <laughs> so does that mean you did have additional symptoms relating to um, effectively menopausal symptoms? Yeah, because I, I, I mean, up until that point, I was still having monthly periods and I hadn't gone... I mean, normally at my age, I would have gone through the menopause essentially, but in my case, I hadn't even missed a period. Um, so I would say within the first few weeks after surgery, I was getting mainly emotional sim symptoms. I was quite weepy and yeah, it was, yeah, it was quite painful. And I have had some hot flushes. I was waking up at night and... I did find after surgery, I mean, certainly for about the first nine months, I didn't have a regular sleep pattern at all, which um, I think it, you know, I mean, you ended up sort of catnapping during the day, you were feeling tired then, and yeah, you weren't able to sleep at night for any longer than two hours. And I don't know whether that's part of the surgery or part of the hormonal, hormonal symptoms. So you had various physical um, complications, but you also had some emotional symptoms, which um, reading between the lines sound quite difficult to deal with. 
Yeah, I feel certainly with, I think with this cancer, there wasn't much information out there. I didn't know anybody who'd had this cancer. And yeah, I, f I felt quite isolated because there's an awful lot of information about breast cancer. And I did at one point think if I see another pink ribbon, I shall absolutely scream. <laughs> Okay. Because people, yeah, they're aware of breast cancer, but this was, it seemed, yeah, there just wasn't the information out there or the support. So, yeah, it's quite an isolating time, really. You felt a bit on your own with the whole thing, maybe? Yeah, yeah, mm. it's quite a, and also, I mean, I'm lucky, I was fortunate enough not to need any chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but with, with regard to the medical profession, I think they they saw me as quite a straightforward case and we've diagnosed your cancer, we've removed it, you don't need any treatment and, you, you know, you're fine. <laughs> In a and sense. emotionally, mm. I wasn't, physically I was okay or on the mend, but emotionally, yeah, I was left. That tells me that there's there's an important lesson there about people with you know illnesses where they seem to be coping okay and we don't necessarily ask many questions about their emotional health and we don't necessarily screen by doing a checklist um, but that person could be struggling we need to be aware that people can be struggling despite their appearance yeah i mean i i did feel the number of people who after my surgery i mean they said oh you look really well and inside i mean on the outside i actually i look well to them i look fine but i i did find it really really difficult because i thought how i felt inside wasn't necessarily reflected on the outside hmm. did you suffer with any particular emotional symptoms for example feeling anxious on edge or feeling down low depressed or angry irritable um I think it was mainly sort of, yeah, it was a, a low, I felt quite low at times. And I think it was actually dealing with the fact that I'd led a very active life beforehand and I found it quite hard to, why was I diagnosed with cancer? And yeah, I, find, I did find that very difficult because I, I don't actually come within the checklist for this cancer. I think the only the only um, risk factor I've got is the fact that I was female and over 50 and I actually can't do anything about either of those. Really. People say, you know, sometimes you think, you know, what, what caused the cancer in my case? Some people say, you know, why me? Why was I diagnosed? Why did I get it? Did I do, do anything to bring it on? Were all those kind of questions on your mind then at that time? Um, yeah, I did think that. I mean... Um, I was actually treated for 11 years for infertility. So I've had a lot of hormonal treatment over the years. So my immediate thought was, was, you know, was my cancer caused by all the hormonal treatment that I've had? I was actually told that they don't think that there is a risk or that there is a link between this. And I was very fortunate enough to have a child as a result of these treatments. So. In fact, the cancer, yeah, I've dealt with that. And, um, so if I can just interpret what you were saying there, um, you had the fertility treatment and that required hormonal treatment. Yep. Um, I guess one way to look at this is, even if there was a slight increased risk of cancer, would you now, if you offered it again, um, have that fertility treatment if it was appropriate? In other words, what would you, what would your choice be if you, now knowing everything you know? Um, knowing all the risks now, I would still go ahead with the fertility treatment. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a child and I wouldn't be without him and I just feel, yeah, my <laughs> life's been enhanced by that. Definitely. Okay, thank you. Talking about the emotional side there, um, sometimes there's a danger things are slightly overlooked or other things that take priority. Um, what was your experience of the aftercare in your case? Um, I mean, as stated before, I literally was sent out of hospital on the Monday morning and I was put in the care of my GP 
but I had no, I mean, there was no district nurse, no other aftercare. And I actually wasn't seen by my consultant until 14 weeks after surgery. So, I mean, that seemed one heck of a, one heck of a long time. And even though you've been put in the care of your GP, it takes a lot of energy. You really get to a bad place before you actually make that phone call. Mm. I think you, I mean, it's just the way these days with trying to get through to your GP, trying to get an appointment. Although I did find they were okay when when I didn't need them. So of, of all the symptoms you were getting then, it was it was the emotional ones you were struggling with, is that right? Mainly, yeah. Or? I mean, I think there was some, I did have some discharge for a number of weeks afterwards. And I mean, my GP did reassure me that it was quite normal. It does take, I mean, you've got all the internal healing, so that, that has to find a way out. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was quite, I mean, that reassured me. Given that there was a slight delay in attending to your emotional needs, is there a way we could deal with things better in terms of how healthcare is organised? Um, I mean, it's maybe GPs need to be aware that we're not just physical bodies, that you know, the emotional part, side is, is really important, especially when you've had a cancer diagnosis and a hysterectomy, I think certainly as a woman, it's quite a, it is, it's quite an emotional thing to go through as well. It's mm. not just a physical, it's not just physical. Even in hospital, 70% um, of emotional needs are attended to by the frontline cancer nurses, as opposed to any hospital mental health specialist yeah. or psychologist. It's rare for that, them to have a specialist unit like ours. You were eventually referred to our service, psycho-oncology, Although not everyone has that, do you feel that's ultimately a benefit? Something that other areas should develop? Yeah, I think definitely. I think, um, I mean, I've actually, I've found it really, really useful. I've only had a couple of appointments, two or three appointments, and I actually feel I've made, I've come on leaps and bounds really. And I wish I could have been referred from maybe a year previously. Mm. It would be nice in a way if we offered something in broad terms, acceptable to people, but simple enough for them to access that was still helping them emotionally as well as physically. Mm. Um, sometimes there's a gap physically, sometimes there's a gap emotionally. Um, ideally, we should plug both those gaps so there's no unmet needs. Yeah, anyway. yeah. I think, um, I mean, I think there are people who maybe with a cancer diagnosis, they literally have the surgery, they want to put it behind them, forget about it and get on with their lives. But I personally feel you need to deal with it there and then. I just feel if it's put away, it'll only come back a few years down the line and maybe in, in some other way. As time went on, um, you were presumably thinking about going back to work. I think you said earlier there was a six month gap when you were off work. Um, we haven't talked about it yet, but what is your line of work? Um, yeah, I work as a complementary therapist. Um, I've trained in aromatherapy, reflexology, Indian head massage. Um, I work for myself, but I actually work, um, I work for the Laura Centre in Leicester, which um, it provides help for people who've lost children or for children who's lost a significant um, person in their life. So I actually offer therapies um, for those people. I also work for Parkinson's um, UK. I do therapies once a month for a group in Oadby. And I also have got regular patients at the London Road Neurological and Special Care Unit, which is for people with late stage Parkinson's, um, multiple sclerosis and brain injuries. Wow, you, you've got a lot of experience there. Um, you're the perfect person to ask how valuable are complementary treatments in terms of an addition to mainstream medical treatment? Yep, I mean, I feel, I mean, obviously, there's no, there's no, I mean, we can't replace things like surgery. If you need to have surgery, I mean, we're not going to replace that. But certainly with, um, I would say, part of the aftercare, it's a part of way of helping cancer patients I think with relaxation, any anxiety, it can help with things like um, any nausea, 
this sort of thing. Yeah, it's just a way of. I think it. I think it just gets people. I think just touch is a basic. Um, it's a basic human need. Mm. And I think sometimes when you've been through a lot and you don't feel very well, I think just having somebody taking the time to touch and give you some care, I think it's, yeah, it's really important. I'm intrigued by the modality of complementary treatments, but I know that in the medical profession it's not always accepted. Sometimes the medical profession thinks, Oh, it's not so evidence-based or it's um, not actually about the treatment, it's just about the placebo effect. But the placebo effect is quite powerful. I mean, it encompasses like trust and communication and um, somebody to talk to. In your experience, um, what, what is the most powerful aspect of giving that complementary treatment? Um, I actually find I think it's really the fact that people, it's developing that trust and I find that people will open up and they will tell you things that they possibly wouldn't tell their family or they wouldn't tell their, their doctor. And I, f I find as well, it is, it's having the time. I mean, a lot of the medical profession, I mean, they do really good work, but they haven't got that time. They haven't got enough time to spend with their patients and I think I think the traditional idea of the nurse by the bedside is um, maybe long gone. They're sort of overworked as well. And I think we do fill that gap that you can give people that time. I think when using the aromatherapy, it's, you know, it's quite a pleasant environment. It's calming, it's relaxing. And I actually feel it is, yeah, it's part of the, the healing process. It's giving people time. Mm. And I think it's it's the touch aspect as well. I think it's yeah. I think it's just letting people know that you know they're cared for. Um, Do any particular co particular complementary treatments lend themselves to cancer care, or would you use any that the patient favours? Um, I mean, in the time that I've been trained, I remember being trained and I was told that we should never touch cancer patients at all. There was a great fear probably 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, that if you actually massaged a cancer patient that you would spread it and cause secondaries. So I know when I was trained, I was very much, it was hands off rather than hands on. And we found out now that you're not necessarily going to cure cancer. But I think um, at whatever stage people are on their cancer journey, it can, um, yeah, it can only have benefit. It can relieve anxiety. It can uplift, and it just makes people, you know, feel calmer and you know able to deal with the situation that they're in. And in terms of practicalities, would would you be able to deliver any of the complementary treatments on a ward? They, uh, well, in a ward setting or in the clinic, would there be um, a setting that best suited certain modalities? Um, yeah, we're, we're actually able to. I mean, I have actually worked as a volunteer on the Osborne unit. So it was 10 years ago we set up a voluntary... Um... Stop. Okay, just take a pause and, <laughs> take a pause and carry on. So you set up something? Um, yeah, I was part of, I mean, I actually didn't set it up. I was part, I was yeah. one of the volunteers that actually yeah. did work on um, on the ward. Um, we offered basic hand massage yes. and I think yeah, we something did. Something we're, we're going to yeah. talk about. Okay, so let's put that on then, because I can say that we're trying to get that up and running again. So you worked on the ward. Yeah, I used to go in on a, on a Friday morning. There was a group of probably about 10 or 12 of us and we offered... I think there was hand massage and I think they offered manicures um, to patients actually in, in their bed. Um, we didn't use any, I think we literally just used a carrier oil, we didn't use any essential oils at this point. But again, it was time, it was, I mean, it was a time just to sort of help the patient. <laughs> How well was that received? Um, it was really well received because there are lots of, I think, the cancer patients on the ward, if they've had a lot of really horrible treatments and they've any, any dealings with the medical profession, they've just had needles and drips and lines put in. It was actually a time where they could, yeah, feel 
feel like a person again really. You can imagine from a patient's point of view every time somebody comes to see them it's like an aversive experience they get a drip a injection you know some kind of procedure that they don't particularly want to have somebody they actually want to see giving them something positive could be uh, restoring a balance in a way yeah i think yeah and i think it was i mean i i actually felt as a as a volunteer i mean i learned a lot i learned a lot about patients and um but yeah, I think they, they just saw you as, you know, you were a human face and not somebody that was going to do something um, awful, awful mm. to them. <laughs> Let's come on to another area now, which is um, who's been there to support you. I'm thinking of the healthcare professionals, but also family, friends. Who's been around for you? Because I remember you saying earlier on this video that you did feel a little bit on your own at some point. So did you have people around to help yeah i mean i i mean i actually i mean i've yeah i've got some really i've got some really good friends and i, I found um yeah they did all all rally around actually i mean i had quite a number of people who'd sort of turn up on my doorstep with meals they'd cooked and yeah one of my friends sort of even yeah she she helped me with my cleaning for about the first month because I, yeah, I couldn't do anything at all. So yeah, I did. I mean, she came and cleaned my bath and scrubbed my scrubbed my kitchen floor for me. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I, yeah, I found um, yeah, families. I mean, yeah, friends and family sort of really useful. Did you find that it was easy to talk about your cancer, or was did you feel there's a slight barrier or stigma in society about it? I did find, yeah, I found it quite difficult to talk about it and I think it's, yeah, it took me a while to get get my own head around it so I didn't, yeah, I did find it really difficult to talk to, to other people about it and um, I'm getting better but, um, yeah, I did find it quite difficult. What kind of reaction did you get from others? Um, I think a lot of people, it was just shock that it had happened to me, right? Yes. <laughs> and I think a lot of people thought, yeah, maybe it should have been them. So I, I did find certainly a lot of my friends about my age, it was just, oh my gosh, if it's happened to you, I suppose they look at their own mortality as well and things that could happen. And mm. um, yeah, I think there were, were people sort of, you know, certainly people my own age were pretty, pretty shocked because I think I was the first one who anything like this had happened to. Did you find that sometimes their anxiety about cancer would prevent them being supportive for you or asking how you're getting on or keeping in touch? Um, I think there's been, yeah, there's been certain, certain people, yeah, I think they say you quite often find out who your friends are when things like this happen. But I mean, mo most were okay. I think I've had one or two who you didn't hear from but I'm, I know that they sort of had their own issues with regard to cancer so maybe that was why I didn't hear from them but generally I think people have been yeah they were supportive hmm. one question I often ask is uh, whether you've come across other patients with cancer not necessarily your type and um, whether that's been a positive experience what, what's your um, view of that? Um, well actually as I was returning to work um, I worked with a colleague at the Laura Centre and I just got myself into a place where great I'm returning to work and I rang her up to start arranging bookings and sorting out the room that we share and she actually announced that she'd just been diagnosed with breast cancer and so literally the week I was returning to work, she actually finished and went off for her surgery. And it was a great, I mean, it was a great shock for me that, um, yeah, I just got myself into a position where I wanted to return to work and having to deal with, you know, a colleague's illness as well. Um, we have actually found through this that we've, you know, we meet up and we've actually discussed how we're getting on and I think we can sort of chat with each other and tell each other things that we wouldn't necessarily tell our family and friends and 
yeah, it's been it's actually been a really positive thing to do. So you kind of support each other. Yeah, in a way. yeah, I think it's been really. And in a way, job. that that peer support is something that's a model we're trying to adopt as well in our centre, and others have done in other centres using the benefit of the experience of past cancer patients to support new cancer patients, mm -hmm. either one to one, like a buddying or mentor system, or in a group group therapy, which mm -hmm. is well known. Do you think that could be a valuable model, having that peer support rolled out in different centres? Yeah, I, th I, th I mean, I, th I think, I mean, certainly I think with my cancer, I just felt there was nobody there when I was diagnosed and I actually would, I would appreciate just somebody, even if you didn't meet up with that person, just somebody on the end of the phone that they could relay their experiences or perhaps reassure you or, um, you know, give give you that encouragement and make you feel a bit better, really. So yeah, I think it'd be something that, you know, I think it's really useful. I'm intrigued to know whether cancer and living through the cancer experience has changed you as a person, whether you've re-evaluated life or whether anything about your outlook is now different to what it used to be. Yeah, I think um, I definitely in some strange way I actually see it as quite a positive experience and I find I don't I don't worry about the future I mean I did at first think well is it going to come back and it's been removed is it going to come back but I don't I don't find that I'm, um, I'm like that now I don't I don't worry about the future and I tend to find that I live each day as it comes and I appreciate I think I'm I think you used to just go through life and you were on a bit of a treadmill, but I actually find now it's making sure that you have time to do things that you enjoy doing. You've still got your responsibilities, which I'm quite happy to to get on and do as well. Um, I've cut back on the amount of work that I do, but I actually feel that the work I do is better. I don't, I don't spread myself as thin. And if I'm tired, I make sure I get time to rest and if I don't want to do something, I don't do it basically. <laughs> What's the importance in your opinion of attending to family needs for relatives who are seeing their loved one go through a cancer experience? You've got some professional views on that and also just your general view. What, what's your view on it? Um, I felt along all along, I think it's actually being honest. I actually think if you I think it's just being honest about your situation. It's being honest about how you feel. I mean, I was honest about my diagnosis. I thought I don't hide it. I actually feel if if you upfront and tell it as it is, I think it's actually less. It's less scary. I think if you hide things, I think people fear things that they don't know about or you know run dry for their imagination. I've always felt it being honest, and I. I told my family straight away. The day I got diagnosed, I literally told them. You prefer an open and honest approach? Sometimes people struggle knowing what to say to their own family. Um, what was your approach uh, in terms of telling them about the diagnosis and or any complications or issues that came up later? Um, I found from the beginning it was easier just to be honest and I literally rang, I rang my husband from the car park in the hospital and just said I've been diagnosed with cancer because I, I just thought he should know really, I don't either want him to hear from somebody else so he was the first person I told and I think the hardest part was telling my son. I didn't know what um, what I was going to tell him, but on the actual morning, um, as when I was driving home, my phone rang on the way home. I arrived on my drive and I checked, and it was from his school. I rang up the school, and he'd actually taken ill. At, he'd been taken ill at school, and the message was that he was making his own way home. So he literally came home within 10 minutes of me getting home myself and I thought I've got I've got to tell him he's here and I literally told him I'd been to the hospital and had been diagnosed with cancer and I was going to have to go in and have an operation and his initial 
sort of reaction was, was I going to lose my hair and end up wearing a wig? I think that was his... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was focusing on that. That was that was what he he just thought that's what cancer, you know, that's what people have with cancer will aren't. <laughs> and how old was he at the time? Um, he was fourteen. Hmm. And um, I've always been very honest with them. Um, yeah, the diagnosis and treatment. How do you think it affected them? How do you think they coped with it all? Um, I think it was a, it was a great shock initially and um but i don't think it, i don't think they realized sort of the enormity of it at the time at all and certainly as i've said before i think with the surgery i think they thought once i was home i'd be okay like i normally was i'd be back you know by the end of the week i'd be back how i used to be but i've actually found since then um i've delegated work at home a lot more and i found that my son He's had to become a lot more independent, so he's learnt how to use a washing machine, sort his colours and his whites. That's got to be a good and, thing. And um, he can change his bed and he can load the tumble dryer and he comes and helps me with the shopping every week. He can, yeah, loads up the trolley and does all of that sort of thing. So any sort of heavy lifting, he, you know, he helps with that. and. Um, yeah, I think there's been a lot. I don't do. I don't do anywhere near as much around the house. I think it's certainly a, a much more sort of balanced. You know, I think everybody's working together more at home, and I think you know my husband and my son they're aware if you you're tired. Yeah, they give you that space, and I can actually, if I need help, I can ask for it. I think before I didn't ask for help, and they just get <laughs> quite cross. But I've found now that if I need help, they can. Yeah, they they will do do what I ask them to do, really. Mm. Do you think that families in general um, need a bit of extra support? You know, I'm, talking, I'm thinking more from the professional point of view, but it could be from uh, the voluntary sector, from, from anywhere, really. Do you think we should attend to caregivers' needs a bit more? Yeah, I actually think, I mean, I quite often find, I think the patients get, they get the medical support, they've got um, nurse, nurses, doctors, yeah, they, they get the support, but I think quite often the caregivers are forgotten and they take they take a lot of the strain, really. I think, yeah, they, they probably save this country quite a lot of money, really. And especially caregivers who perhaps have got their own medical mobility needs as well. I've actually found they do, it is quite stressful, very stressful for caregivers. Mm. I understand today is a special day regarding uterine and womb cancer. Uh, what is what is today? Um, it's actually International Womb Cancer Awareness Day. Um, the whole of September has actually been designated as Womb Cancer Awareness Month, and we're trying to, you know, turn turn the world peach actually rather than pink. I think it's pink for breast cancer, but we actually have it as peach. So we have got a, an online sort of Facebook page where we're trying to get as many of our Facebook friends changing their profile pictures to something to do with peach throughout the month. But it's, I mean, it's a fun thing to do, but it's also trying to raise awareness of this little known cancer. Um, in Britain, there are 23 women every day are diagnosed with womb cancer, of which five will die. And it's five people who will be losing a mother, a sister, an auntie, and a family member. <laughs> wow. Um, and um, yeah, I've had a friend of mine has actually made these sort of loom bands. I think they're quite a craze at the moment and yeah peach, peachy coloured bracelet and we've been selling these I, I sell them at my um, dance fitness class that i go to twice a week and we've actually raised um raised over 50 pounds so far just for the um, womb cancer support uk which is based online at the moment wow it's brilliant you're bringing that awareness to this to this area like i said at the beginning it's an area where both the medical profession and um, the public in general maybe aren't as aware of it as we should be. So it's brilliant that you're bringing that to the attention of so many people. 
And I want to thank you on a personal note for coming in today and sharing your story. I found it a really brilliant account. And a lot of the things I think people will identify with, whether they've got a uterine cancer or afraid of it or you know, have somebody in the family with a cancer. I think your skills also in your area in terms of complementary treatments are a brilliant insight into how important that is as well to bring to um, not just patients but families as well. So thanks for coming in and sharing your story. Thank you. Uh, wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Take care then. Thank you.